Good afternoon, everyone. We're going to wait just a couple minutes as more people are trying to join in. So just hang tight and we'll begin within the next couple of minutes. Okay, I always wait to, or hate to wait too long because I know we've got a lot to get through today and you guys are anxious to get to content. So we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, for those of you who are returning from last week, welcome back. Thanks for joining us again. Um, for those of you who are new this week, my name is Paul Yader. I am the Summer Administrator for the Department of Community and Summer Education here at Point Park. And we're so happy that you're able to join us today and to take advantage of these great opportunities. Um, just a quick few housekeeping things, a reminder that these sessions are being recorded. Um, so we just like to put that out there. You'll see in the chat that I put some social media outlets. We'd love for you to share your experience um, today. And if you had any other classes that you've taken with us, please feel free to share. Um, use that hashtag point park together apart as we're trying to spread that as much as possible. Um, Q&A will be happening at the end of the session. So if you have any questions for Stacy, please feel free to drop those in the chat and we will do our best to get them all answered by the end. Um, so without further ado, I am pleased to present one of our very own current graduate students. Um, she is an intern and an employee in the Center for Media Innovation on Point Park's campus, uh, Stacy Federoff. We are very excited to have her today. So Stacy, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to you. Thank you so much. And thanks everyone for being here. I really appreciate it. Um, uh, as uh, he mentioned, um, I'm a graduate assistant at the Point Park Center for Media Innovation. And uh, this summer I'm working as a communications intern at Mindful Creative, a public relations agency here in Pittsburgh. Um, but before that, I spent eight years as a journalist and I continue to freelance write and edit. Um, I spent five years as a reporter, and three of those years I also uh, managed social media as part of my job. Um, and what do you need for social media? Graphics. Uh, <laughs> two of those three years, I also did some newspaper page design. And um, prior to that, I got my undergrad degree at Penn State University in journalism. And uh, I took a newspaper design course using this book, uh, Newspaper Designer's Handbook from 2008. And um, so this book was really helpful in uh, putting my presentation together. Uh, and so you'll see a lot of good examples from this book um, that kind of broadly also apply to graphic design. And I put a reference to it at the end. But I used a physical book. Uh, <laughs> so when I was first asked um, to give this uh, workshop, at first I was like, what? I don't know anything about graphic design. I, you know, I worked in newspapers. But it turns out that newspaper design is a type of graphic design. 
Um, a lot of the same principles apply to newspapers as they do websites, flyers, graphics, um, and some of them even apply to the design of physical objects and, and spaces, but that's like a whole different subject entirely. Uh, but first, I wanted to show you these uh, two newspaper pages. Actually, I did not design these pages, but um, I have a story that runs across all three pages here. Um, but I wanted to just show you these, first of all, because um, maybe some of you haven't seen a newspaper page in a while or ever uh, printed. Um, <laughs> just wanted to uh, show you what they look like. Um, but you'll notice um, maybe, you know, as soon as you look at the, at the pages, uh, your eye is drawn to certain things. Uh, so maybe it's the uh, photo, the uh, dominant photo on the section front there um, that's larger than any of the other photos on the, on the top left. Uh, or maybe it's the ad, um, the use of color in the ad and how much space the ad takes up on the second page there in the middle. Or maybe the standing head, that, which is uh, where it says community on the very top left. Um, and the use of color there, or maybe it's the um, breakout box um, sort of in the center of that beige color. And um, the thing about that is no matter where your eye goes, if it's drawn to one, any one of those elements, that's not by accident. That's all a part of design. So then uh, you ask yourself, what, what makes uh, something well designed. What makes something good design? And um, I sent you that, that video and uh, uh, that kind of that went over most of these. And uh, thanks to those who sent in some of their examples. But I wanted to briefly touch on each of these, which you know we could dedicate an entire workshop to uh, each of them by themselves. Uh, but um, these are kind of 10 principles, like major principles of design that you kind of take with you as you uh, are thinking about the message you want to communicate and how you're going to communicate it with, design, with graphic design. So the first one is balance, which has to do with stability and structure, um, taking the visual weight of each element uh, where they, the elements don't always need to be equal size necessarily, but they should either be symmetrical or asymmetrical. Uh, can't really show you that with my hands, but uh, you know, um, one third and, and two thirds, or exactly symmetrical, half and half, maybe something like that. Um, proximity, the next one, uh, is the relationship between similar or related items. And that doesn't necessarily mean that they're grouped together, but that they're all visually connected. And um, We'll, we'll maybe point that out in some of the other examples. Um, alignment, um, maybe you've heard that word, you know, when, uh, it, when you're using, you know, Microsoft Word, something like that. Is it either center aligned, left aligned, right aligned? Um, it just gives an ordered appearance and creates that visual connection between the elements. Um, the next one, visual hierarchy, uh, is using the visual weight that we talked about and distributing it across the elements. Um, the hierarchy would mean there's something that is the most important down to something that's least important. Um, and we use that a lot in newspapers. I'll talk about that later. The next one is repetition. Um, you're probably familiar with that term. Uh, repeating elements create a rhythm and strength by tying together the, and give it, uh, the elements of giving it the overall design a consistency. Contrast uh, is the difference between two opposing design elements, you know, light and dark, um, you know, a thick typeface versus a thin one, um, using that contrast to, um, again, balance the visual weight. Color. Uh, dictates the mood and the tone of the message. Um, and, you know, color theory is an entire, again, 
you know, entire subject matter in and of itself, what colors to use when, um, you know, the, the different feelings you have when you look at something that's red versus something that's green or yellow or blue. Um, and that's very important when it comes to branding, things like that, wanting, um, wanting to convey a certain tone with your messaging. Um, then we have negative space, which is the area between or around elements. And uh, they can actually, the negative space can actually create its own shape that highlights some sort of important connection between the elements that are part of your design. Um, have you ever noticed in the Pittsburgh Zoo logo that uh, there's a tree in the middle, but in the negative space, there's uh, two animals on either side. Uh, so next time you see the zoo logo, check that out. Um, then typography, which is a, main, a major uh, portion of uh, designing newspapers. Um, it, it regards the, the letter forms of the text and its design. So the, we'll talk a little bit about this later. The weight, the typeface, the style, and the bold, what font is it in, um, that sort of thing. And then once you understand all of those other rules, you can break them. <laughs> Just like in any art form, uh, when you have that foundation, um, that means you understand when it might be necessary or important to break the rules and effectively communicate your message. Um, so I did have uh, a couple examples that uh, you sent in. Um, so uh, I wanted to look at them. I think Paul is going to put them in the chat, all the, the links to them, so you can uh, see all of them. Um, but stand by. I will put those right in for you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and if you let's start with. Let's start with um, Vancy. Are you here? If you could un unmute yourself. I'm here. Hi. Right. Um, so you sent in the MasterCard logo. Yeah. Um, and uh, I think you had told me in your email, but um, describe me some of those elements that we talked about that you liked about the MasterCard logo that, you could um, make, that, that makes a good design. I definitely thought that it had good alignment, like the words were right in the center of the circles. And um, I thought that the two different colored circles provided a sort of contrast, and then they made a pattern in the middle with the stripes. And um, the balance, just, right? The, the fact that it's two circles. Yeah. The balance, it yeah. And the typography, you know, I'm sure they they went through tons of font of choices before they picked that one. Mm -hmm. um, which one? Which one conveys what our brand is trying to say? And now every time you see those two circles, I've even seen it like parodied on shirts and stuff. You know, um, that, you, that your brain automatically thinks of Mastercard, which I think makes it a good logo. Yeah, a great example. Thanks so much. Thank you. Um, next we have, uh, Carla. Carla, are you here? If you can, un you can unmute yourself. She's in, in this image. Maybe Carla's not here. Oh, I see Carla. Well, maybe we'll circle back around to Carla. Um, is Nikki here? Yes. Hi, Nikki. Hello. Um, you, you sent in this image, right? Yes. This is target lady. Um, so why did you choose this image? What, um, what about this says good design to you? Well, it has, um, Definitely has repetition and contrast. Um, balance, I think. I mean, it's it's all uh, the lines are straight and they repeat yeah. 
obviously, and the colors. Mm -hmm. And she's very symmetrical. Like even, even the way her arms are, are almost like exactly symmetrical. Her hair is the same shape on both sides. Um, and yeah, how they place the dots. And yeah, you mentioned the color. So that's a great example. I mean, all of Target, you know, all of their advertising um, has a lot of great design to it. Um, then uh, next we, uh, so thank, thanks, Nikki. Thank you. Um, next we have uh, Anne Marie. Hello. Hi, Anne Marie. So um, I, I wanted to use your example because uh, you, you actually chose a website that your students created. And yes. so what do you, what do you consider uh, good design about this, this website? Well, I don't know. Cause uh, the, I watched the video you sent out yesterday and because I'm so new to this, that was the first I was ever introduced to those principles of design. So you were looking for examples. I thought I'd send it in and see. Oh, oh, I see. I see. Okay. Well, uh, I, th when I looked at it, I think color oh, is, I is well used here, right? Oh. The, um, Red and the blue. You're you're carrying the red from the uh, the logo, uh, and uh, imagine is that the school colors? Red and blue. Yes. Sorry, I just keep muting because my kids are. <laughs> oh, no, no, that's fine. <laughs> um, so then you know you're carrying the red through the typography. The 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 font that you chose is very bold and it's really easy to read. So that you know when somebody's uh, looking at it maybe on their phone. Uh, it's really easy to read it. It's not um, too um, cluttered. I think it has a good alignment. Like you see here, the, the heading, the sports here in the middle. Um, so I, I think it was a good example. So thanks for sending that in. Thank you. All right. So thanks everyone who contributed those. We're gonna go back to my slides here. That's to get it get us started, but um, so keeping those uh, kind of rules in mind, uh, why does good design matter? Well, um, you can think of it uh, when it comes to these three C's: content, convenience, and composition. So quality content means that uh, it's informative. Your design is giving something to the reader. Uh, is sharing your message um, and they're taking something away from it. So even if it is purely um, uh, graphical and, and there's no text, they still, you know, a color can convey a mood or um, a shape can, uh, you know, um, impart like a feeling. And so it's important that uh, the content is there for the reader or viewer. Then the next uh, reader convenience means that it's inviting and engaging. It's easy to read um, it's, and navigate and understand whether it's you know, a printed flyer, uh, a billboard, a website. And then um, you have the third C, uh, artistic composition, which is kind of a, a combination of the both, the content and the layout working together to communicate the full message creatively. So, um, you know, anytime you go to design something, you can think about it in those terms to, to um, actually convey your message more effectively. So if you're going to sit down and design something, once you have the, the three C's in mind, um, I think you need to consider uh, these four things. First of all, your purpose. Um, so what is the message that you're trying to get across? Is it news like the student's website? Is it an advertisement? Is there a call to action? Do you want the reader and viewer to take, you know, to sign up for an event or buy a product? Um, what's your purpose? Uh, then next is your audience. Um, is, is it a particular demographic that you're looking at? Is it a general public audience? Is it, uh, um, by, by geography? Is it just people in Pittsburgh? Is it by, you know, profession? Something that's um, kind of uh, um, 
a smaller group, like or if your audience is dentists, you can use jargon and phrases and maybe imagery that uh, dentists recognize more readily than, you know, some other group farmers or something like that. Um, a good example, I think, when I was thinking of audience is what, uh, whether or not you use swear words. There are different, and I, of course, because I'm a journalist, I think about it in terms of journalism. Um, you know, some publications, some news outlets, they don't mind swear words. They, they um, think that their audience is adult enough to understand we can use swear words. Some places, they put the little asterisks. And other places will take out the swear words entirely. So that's, that's kind of a, an example that I, that I thought of. Um, next thing to consider is the media or the platform. So are you um, going to have something that is digital? It's on social media. Is it on a website? Is it um, going to be printed? What size will it be? Is it a billboard? Um, and that'll all dictate parts, elements of your design. Um, you also need to think about if it's going to be um, on, seen on a cell phone um, or if it's responsive, if the website um, changes with the size of the device that it's being uh, viewed on. And those are all considerations when you go to make your design because you wouldn't want, you know, someone's picture to get cut off or type to be too small to read, um, that, that sort of thing. Um, and then lastly, uh, coming from working with teams on the design a lot, um, I think that it's good to also consider all the elements. If you're working on a team, you know, and someone else is writing the copy, that the text that you're going to have, uh, do you have that text? If you have a a photo, do you need to work with a, a photographer and get that photo and get the caption information? Um, even something as simple as logins, you know, if you're using uh, software to create the design or um, to upload the design or to launch the website, do you have all that gathered so that when you go down to, to sit down to create your design, um, you will uh, be able to build uh, build your design effectively. So then, uh, once you have all that, uh, there are some, you know, major elements that uh, I learned a lot about from newspapers. And first, what would a newspaper be without typography? Uh, so, um, first, you may have heard the term font, um, but, uh, you know, as it it comes to like word processing and that sort of thing. But a font back in the printing days was actually a complete set of characters in a typeface. And there are different types of fonts. Um, and when you're thinking about your design, you want to consider which would be the most appropriate to use. Um, the first kind of family uh, of fonts are serif or sans serif. And you can see from the example here, um, see on the P or at the end of the S and Sphinx at the bottom, um, those are serifs, the kind of little feet on the ends of the letters. Um, this kind of goes back to your audience. Um, if, uh, you know, you maybe have an older demographic, you want to be able, you want them to be able to read it more easily and serif fonts are easier to read when you have a lot of text. Um, the next type is uh, cursive or script fonts. And those are, you know, you see those a lot of wedding invitations and wedding decorations. It made it look like handwriting. Um, you know, if you want to convey that type of a mood, you want to use that type of font. And then last, you have novelty or display font. So those you might use for headlines, something to grab someone's attention. Um, if you only have one word or one phrase that's a part of your design, you can use a really detailed looking font um, that is in a big point size, and that will convey your message. Speaking of point size, that is a printing measurement. Uh, if you've heard that term before, the points, you know, it's 24 point font. Actually, 72 points used to equal one inch back in the day. Wanted to just uh, teach you some terminology so you can sound like a pro when you're doing your design. Um, <laughs> and so here on the right, uh, 
there are some other guidelines about typography um, and terminology that you may or may not need or use, but I wanted to, to give those to you. Letting is the space between the lines of font and tracking is the space between each individual letter. And then you have set with, which you can do on a lot of digital um, programs now, which is just stretching out the entire word together. Um, just so you have, have that background. Next, uh, I wanted to talk about photos. Um, and a lot of, um, you know, social media, um, a lot of web design is driven by good photography. So first you want to ask yourself when it comes to photos, how, how do the photos tell the story? Um, do you need more than one photo to tell the story or does one photo have all the action in it? Is the one photo dynamic enough uh, that that conveys the message you're trying to get across? Um, to that end, then you don't really need to use repetitive images. They're basically the same unless it's to, deliberately a part of your design, like we talked about, repetition. Um, next, uh, captions in, the, in newspapers are called cut lines. Um, so you wanna make sure that um, a caption under the photo conveys information or explains what's happening in the photo. And then uh, particularly important in this day and age of um, you know, giving credit uh, where, where you should give credit and, um, uh, what do you want to say, compensating uh, creators for their efforts, you want to be sure to give photo credits when you can. Um, coming from newspapers, I'm a big proponent of that. Uh, but speaking of newspapers, we used to have a rule uh, where you should keep faces the size of a dime. And I understand that now, you know, you wouldn't be printing things as often. But that's kind of um, a good way to imagine, you know, especially with things on your phone, keeping things large enough so that you can really, the reader or the viewer can really um, get involved in the action, understand the story. And um, speaking of getting involved in the action, photos should, uh, the subject should have somewhere to go. If they are kicking a ball, if they're riding their bike, if, uh, there's something going on, there's an airplane, it should have somewhere to go within the photo so that the viewer can automatically understand what's happening. For that reason, you don't wanna crop things too, too close, and you also don't wanna lead the reader off of the, of the page, even if you're not printing it, say. Um, if you can, um, if you see this um, example on the right of this eel, uh, the eel is facing toward the text, toward the headline, so that your eye goes from the eel right into the text and you're reading the story. Um, and uh, a rule of, uh, a good rule of thumb is if there's body copy, if there's text, you don't want to interrupt it with art because then that's one more way to lose your reader or your viewer. And um, the last thing that the, this example is showing is you want to when you do have a group of photos, you want to put them all together in a dynamic way so that there is one clear dominant photo and that will tell a stronger story than if they're all equal size. So you see here on the left, they're all equal size and they're still great photos. And uh, the, you know, the headline is still really good and it draws you in, but contrast that with the example on the right where like, wow, look at, all these different animals and I, my eye knows exactly where to go um, it, uh, because of the mix of horizontal and vertical photos and also the different sizes. Next I want to talk about headlines which are uh, really prominent in uh, newspapers but in all kinds of other graphic designs. You want to keep them short and conversational. They should always be uh, when, when appropriate, uh, present tense and active voice. So active voice means you have a subject and a verb at the beginning. Um, it's really easy, especially for social media, um, you know, and sometimes you don't have to do this all the time, but 
that that um, draws you into the act. What is the action? What is what is happening uh, in with your headline uh, for the viewer or reader to to see? Um, and to that end, it should be accurate and understandable. Um, when you have a lot of information, uh, like in a newspaper, and your headlines are right up against each other, it's confusing as to which you should read. Almost kind of like, even though these are saying the same thing, my example down at the bottom, um, it's kind of hard to tell which one is more important than the other. Like we learned about photos, they're both basically about the same size, and they're right up against each other. So one doesn't dominate the other, and I'm kind of confused as to which to read first. Um, keeping them next to the copy is a good uh, rule of thumb. Um, the thing that I learned about headlines that I didn't realize until I uh, worked at a newspaper was that um, good headlines don't break up phrases so that they're easier to read. And then that can be applied to any graphics. You know, I've used that all the time you kind of think about just one more, that's one more way to lose someone's interest. If a phrase is cut short and there's a blank space and then you're off, you're doing something else. You're scrolling, <laughs> you're scrolling away. So um, the example there at the bottom, rock and roll causes acne, doctor say, says that you wouldn't break rock in and then put roll on a separate line. You want rock and roll to all be one complete thought before you move on to the next one. Um, as I mentioned with, uh, we mentioned with visual hierarchy, headlines are um, best when they are ordered by largest to smallest, most important to least important. So your eye goes right to the largest headline like we saw in the uh, beginning example, and uh, then works its way if there are more headlines all the way down the page. Or say, you know, say then farther down your flyer you have, you have smaller type, a, a, a headline, yes, but it's in smaller type. And then you know, okay, this is where I need to start and um, read all the way down. Um, and then the last thing, consider the number of decks. Um, a deck in headline, in newspaper speak, are, are the lines that the headline takes up. So rock and roll causes acne, doctor says, is three decks. You wouldn't probably wanna go more than that because again, that confuses the reader, you're thinking, wow, that's a lot of important information that I am trying to take in all at once. It's a lot easier to read if it's stretched out across a larger space. Or, you know, you're putting that, you're putting maybe some secondary information um, that's still important next to the headline to explain two separate thoughts. Um, so I think, uh, I think that's all I have for that. And there's some more, you know, these, these terms and things uh, when it comes to newspaper headlines or here in this uh, top right example. Um, but you can, you know, you can also kind of see the, the way headlines can be laid out differently, uh, you know, to draw, to draw you into the design. Speaking of laying everything out all together, um, I think uh, graphics and flyers are, allow you to break the rules a little bit um, because you know you have a single thought, you have a single message that you want to convey. Come to the book fair, uh, <laughs> or um, you know, uh, car for sale, something like that. Uh, whereas a newspaper has a lot of information that they're that are trying to convey to you all at once. Um, so. Um, the uh, thing about layout, and you can look at these examples, um, you know, and kind of make your own judgment from what we talked about when it comes to headlines, photos, uh, but, um, you know, you can use boxes to separate text into different but connected thoughts. So like we saw in the very first page, uh, in the first slide, um, that box kind of sets things apart, keeps things organized. Um, one of the rules that I learned from newspapers is that uh, if uh, you have a space that's the size of a dollar bill and all that it's touching is body copy, then you might want to consider redesigning it uh, or, you know, adding some different elements, um, you know, uh, changing the, the layout, of, you know, making things fit differently so that it's more dynamic and draws the reader in. Um, 
And then, like we talked about in the design principles, it's good to remember white space. Um, in newspapers, we always tried to keep everything full of text and everything full of images um, because uh, that's what the that's what the newspaper is for to to be full of information. But when you're designing a, a graphic, a flyer, um, white space can be its own design element, and you can leave things room to breathe. And especially with margins, especially with social media, you know, you don't know what the um, the which device is going to cut off things around the edges. Sometimes it's going to keep things um, so that there there is some white space. And uh, just to bring this back uh, to not you know not just thinking about newspapers, but when it's web design, you have the same kind of things to consider, um, like we talked about. Uh, with the three C's at the beginning. Um, the size of the platform, whether it's responsive or static, whether it's on a desktop or mobile. Um, surprisingly, uh, I took a web design class at Point Park and um, when, you, when you think about a website, you're doing the same thing as a newspaper with um, elements that are above the fold that draw you in. So anything on the first top half of the screen is going to be above the fold and that's right where the viewer or the reader is going to go first and if you cut everything off at the fold they're not going to want to be scrolling down so that's something to think about um, and when it comes to to those three c's that we talked about um, web design you want to use coordinating colors um, uh, a mix of fonts but not too many uh, so that the reader or the viewer understands that it's user-friendly layout and navigation that um, say, you know, in the early days of the internet, there would be um, a whole uh, maybe background of a website where one page was a different color from another. But that's, that's confusing to someone who's trying to navigate the page. And for that reason, uh, consistency is also important in web design. You know, if it's a button, uh, once you see a green button, you're going to look for another green button uh, on a different web page on the same website and you're going to understand what that button does. So that's kind of like a lot of theory behind things, but I wanted to um, use this last part and talk about uh, tools that you can use. Um, uh, on the free side of things, um, I use Canva all the time. Um, it's uh, just canva.com, um, and I have I'll, I have a slide of resources at the end as well. Um, but Canva uh, allows you to do a lot of graphic design, even if you don't know most or any of the theory that I uh, <laughs> just talked about. It has a lot of guides that it'll where it'll snap your graphics right to the guides. Um, it'll a line comes up and shows you exactly where the middle is. Um, you can start with templates, um, and uh, I'll, I'll, I might show you a little bit of it if I if I have time. But I'm, I want to be conscious of having a lot of time for questions and that sort of thing. Um, Canva also has its own design school with a lot of videos that you can watch that go over different um, functions that the software has, and it's completely online. Um, the design school and Canva itself. Um, and I found it to be really easy to use and um, even starts out where you can choose the size. Um, say you want to make a Facebook post, you start on the Facebook post size and you, and you go right along. It does, they do have a subscription that you can pay for where you get more features, but otherwise it's completely free and I've used it for my work. Um, the one thing, the one pro tip I will give you about Canva is that um, you can use an eyedropper Chrome extension because that's the one thing that Canva doesn't have that say um, Photoshop when we get to it or InDesign or any of the other Adobe software have um, is an eyedropper to match the colors. So if you don't know um, what color you want, but you want to match a color, um, if you're working in Chrome, you can put, uh, you can download an extension for your browser and 
drag your cursor over a particular color and match that color exactly, put the code into Canva and you're, you're off to the races. So that's my, that's my like major pro tip <laughs> for everyone. Um, and then uh, on the other side of things are Photoshop, InDesign, Illustrator, all part of the Adobe Creative Cloud. Um, the thing about Adobe is that it's a subscription, but it's industry standard across the board. Once, if you are, you know, just getting into graphic design and you're interested, if you take a workshop or you watch some YouTube videos about Photoshop or InDesign, then once you know that, you will have that knowledge and you will probably use it. You can use it in your everyday life to edit photos. Um, it's extremely helpful. Um, I have used similar programs called Affinity Photo and Affinity Designer, where you only pay a one-time fee um, to download the software. Uh, whereas Adobe, um, it's called the Creative Cloud because you have that subscription and it keeps renewing. Um, you don't actually own the software, which is a bit of a uh, sticking point for some people. But um, so I wanted to give you those tools and I wanted to show you um, a couple of these examples uh, that I've created using Canva, um, where uh, you can see I try to use the uh, design rules um, that we talked about. Um, on the left, um, that building your personal brand, that orange um, graphic was actually a flyer, a printed flyer. So you see the um, alignment happening there, the colors, the visual hierarchy uh, with the headline. Um, similar, the top center example, uh, the Avenue of Flags has a visual hierarchy with the type um, mixes the serif and the sans serif fonts um, so that it's easier to read and um, kind of gives that contrast. Um, and, um, you know, uh, you can look at a lot of these other graphics uh, in a similar, you know, with similar elements um, here. Um, but, um, That's pretty much all I had. Uh, I wanted to give you this uh, references and resource page, like I said, because I used so many examples from uh, my textbook, the Newspaper Designer's Handbook. They, there is a newer version, 2013. I wouldn't like totally recommend that you buy it because it's just very, very specific to newspapers, but um, I needed to cite them because I used so many examples. Um, uh, there is the um, web, uh, the web page, the, I used um, the article about the 10 principles of graphic design. Um, and then here are a couple of tools. Uh, like I mentioned, the um, color picker in Chrome. And the uh, other tool is this Coolers uh, tool online um, where you can actually generate a color palette. So um, if you wanted to, um, you know, say use this, um, purplish black color on the far left, um, you could lock that color and then generate other colors and then see which colors matched um, if, you were, if you were using them all to say lay out a website or something like that. And the um, code down there, um, I believe I'm, I think it's a hex code, which stays the same, which is used in web design. So if you copied that, color code, you could use that everywhere, you know. Um, and I also wanted to touch on, there's the, there's the, uh, also the uh, URL for the Canva Design School. And then I also wanted to mention, uh, since I wanted to keep in mind, you know, if we have some, if we have some high school students or college students um, uh, here today, um, that, you know, you can use graphic design in a lot of different jobs some which are directly related to art, um, but others, uh, you know, kind of, it's, you know, um, kind of related to graphic design, um, but combines different, um, you know, technology, um, the STEM fields, that sort of thing. So, you know, you can be in game design or fashion design or web design. Um, 
or, uh, but you can also be in marketing and you can, uh, advertising, you think about packaging, um, and, uh, even all the way up to, you know, being a teacher or a professor of design and, uh, even being an, an engineer. Um, you know, you can start with, uh, like my, my sister, I uh, really enjoyed art in, um, high school. Uh, but she also, you know, used the other side of her brain as well in science. And so she can kind of combine that and now she's an engineer. So, um, yeah, I wanted to leave you kind of thinking about that. I appreciate, uh, your time. And uh, you can see my email address there at Point Park and then my Twitter handle uh, by S. Federoff there. So uh, feel free to uh, send me any thoughts or questions. Um, but now we should have some time, right, for, for questions from everyone. We do. Um, so guys, yeah, if you have any questions, please feel free to um, drop those in the chat. Um, Stacey, I think we've had a lot of people who are interested and um, in re-seeing your PowerPoint. So if it's okay, I think we're gonna send that out to everyone just for reference, yeah. lots of good stuff in there. Um, I know that I've fallen in love with Canva over the past seven months in this job and it's just been incredible for someone who is very, very um, new to the world of graphic design and marketing. Canva is a lovely tool to just kind of um, get your feet wet and like the guides that you were saying are very, very helpful in, in terms oh, yeah. of making things visually appealing. Um, I can so bring I it up. I was, I didn't want to run out of time, but. Um, no, yeah, I think we're good. <laughs> so uh, yeah, if there's any questions. Um, Annette did ask something. Uh, why did you say to use a dime sized photo? Oh, dime sized. That's for faces. Um, when you're thinking about, faces um that was the dime was um kind of the standard if you think about how big a newspaper page is you know um maybe like you know 20 24 inches you know and to keep faces that big so you can so you can actually see the people's features and they um you know it registers in your brain as a face if it's if it's much 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 smaller unless it's like a big crowd something like that but if it's a face you want someone to look at. You don't want it to be so, so tiny that it doesn't register as a face, that it doesn't draw someone in um, to the photo. So thanks, happy to clarify that. Again, that might not be always applicable, like if it's on social media or something like that, you can't really measure if it's a dime, but this kind of like, just a way to think about keeping a face large enough so you can see it. Awesome. Yeah, I think um, if you want to go ahead and explore Canva just a little bit or give them a yeah. tour, that'd be awesome. Um, so when you sign up for Canva, um, you come to kind of this page um, where you can automatically start with the templates. You know, you have all these different, you know, you want to do a Facebook post. And like I said, it will give you the well, this is giving you the actual templates, like the already designed graphics that you can just go in and edit, but we can also create a design that's the Facebook post. And it knows uh, the dimensions that Facebook likes, you know, so that when you download it and upload it to Facebook, it's not like cutting off part of the design. It's, um, you can see it came up Oh, it came up before. Oh, it came up here. Um, that it's 940 by 788, and that's the size um, that Facebook likes. But you can um, come over here to the to the right hand side or left hand side, and um, say we want to start with a template. It's Halloween party. And it'll just pop in this template and then I can edit the text however I want. And, um, you know, edit the graphics, change the colors up here. And here is where you would put in that hex code. Um, let's try whatever this color is that 
Oops. You know, that's a blue. We're going to change that spider to blue. <laughs> but um, you can also start from a blank Facebook post. And um, upload different, uh, you know, if you want to use a photo, um, different photos that like are on your um, desktop. You see mine has a lot of Point Park stuff, the GSA. Um, what I was talking about, the color picker is here now on my Chrome, uh, the, my Chrome browser. And I can say, pick color from website. I don't remember what the GSA green is, but I want it to match it exactly. So it's gonna bring this little box over. And now I've picked the green. So it's over here and I can take the hex code and say I want to make the background green. Paste it in there and now it's that exact color green that I wanted. And so, um, you know, uh, yeah, there's there, that solid purple line is right, right in the exact middle and it does it both vertical and horizontal. Um, or if you have other elements, it will match. So that's exactly in line with the uh, other graphic so that, you know, we're achieving that balance that we talked about <laughs> um, and repetition. So the sizes are in alignment, right? Um, <laughs> um, what else? Oh, you can um, say if you have some text, over here, you, they have some templates for text uh, that are where it's grouped together. You see this has the visual hierarchy. You might even recognize it from that uh, high school media day graphic that I created. I probably used this template. Um, <laughs> and um, you can then um, do all kinds of things. This is the, they call it uh, the line height but we learned today that that's letting, right? And then the letter, the, le the space between the letters, um, the kerning. <laughs> is, it, is it just kerning, right? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and um, then you can even make it transparent. You could do that, say, if you wanted this graphic to be in the background, you wanted to make it transparent just be kind of ghostly there in the background um, and, you know so it's it's so easy to use um, that uh, it's a great place to start and you know all you have to do is sign up for it not that like I'm being paid by Canva to tell you this but <laughs> once you sign up that's all you have to do um, and this is kind of a good way to get your feet wet as compared to signing up for a full subscription of Adobe, um, unless you're really in the commit, you know, uh, because like I said, once you learn Adobe, it's um, uh, used across the board and it'll be good to have those skills. Um, yeah. Um, I just want to re-underline for those of you who are Adobe you know, lesser inclined like myself, Canva is, is a lovely first step. So definitely. Um, okay, well, if there are no other questions for Stacy, we would just like to, Stacy, give you a big thank you for sharing your knowledge with us today and a big thank you to all of you as well who came out to join us. Um, be sure to uh, tune in. We've got still four more weeks yet of, of lovely content set up for you um, and we will be sending that presentation out. So if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to Stacy or us and we will be happy to help. So thank you all again and we look forward to seeing you next week. Thanks everyone.